Today we're going to talk about lake formation and origin. Where are lakes on Earth, and how did they get there? We live in Wisconsin, a state with lots of lakes. But how many are there? Are there 82,000 lakes? Are there 15,000? Or are there only 5,000? What do you think? Well, no matter what you chose, you're correct. There's actually 82,000 mapped ponds and lakes in the state of Wisconsin. But many of these are very small, and so we don't think about them very often. Often we hear there's 15,000 lakes. This is the number of lakes cited by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. But really, this is all lakes greater than one hectare in area. Also, we hear the number 6,000. That's the total number of lakes larger than four hectares. And 5,481? Well, that's the number of lakes that are named in Wisconsin. Here's a neat graph from the DNR showing the number of lakes that are named versus unnamed. What you can see is there aren't that many big lakes, lakes over, say, 100 acres in size, and we've named all of them. That's because we use big lakes, and we want to have a name for them so we can reference them. On the other hand, most lakes under 24 acres don't have an official name. That's because people don't talk about them as often. So how many lakes are there on Earth? Well, you saw how hard it was to decide how many lakes there are in Wisconsin. So at this point, let's just say there's hundreds of millions of lakes on Earth. So even if we can't count every single lake on Earth, we can ask, where are most of them and how did they form? First, we need to ask ourselves the question, what are lakes? Well, lakes are areas that fill with water, that are surrounded by land. And that second definition differentiates them from the ocean. We often consider lakes bigger than a pond, but this is subjective, and ponds are lakes too. We also differentiate lakes from rivers by saying that the water's not flowing. We consider lakes lentic systems. So if lakes are areas that fill with water, why are all landscape depressions not lakes? Above is a picture of a retention basin, but you can see that the basin is dry. There's currently no water in it. Well, if you've ever tried to build a moat in a sandcastle, you've learned the lesson that water drains. So where water drains quickly, lakes will rarely form. And if they do, they're often temporary. We actually use this to our advantage in urban infrastructure, so that the retention basin above will fill with water when it rains, storing water during a storm, and then slowly letting it drain over time. And because of the fact that water drains, there's much more groundwater on Earth than there are lakes. What the graph and the table both show is the distribution of water on Earth. And what we can see is that most water on Earth is stored in the oceans. About 96.5% of total global water is in the oceans. Only 2.5% of water on Earth is freshwater. And of that freshwater, almost all of it is stored in groundwater and in glaciers and ice caps. Lakes only make up 0.013% of total water on Earth, and only about 21% of surface water. So every time you see a lake, remember what you're seeing is actually quite rare. So the presence of lakes is driven by the hydrological cycle. Lakes gain water by precipitation, rain and snow, by river input, and by groundwater discharge into lakes. And they lose water by river outflow, from groundwater recharge, and from evaporation. So for lakes to form, we need more water coming in than water going out. And those inputs versus outputs determine water level. So when inputs are greater than outputs, excess water usually drains, typically via a river. But some basins don't have outflow rivers. And in these closed basin lakes, when the inputs are greater than the outputs, water level rises. On the right, you can see an image of Devil's Lake, North Dakota. An increase in precipitation between 1993 and 1999 actually caused the lake to double in size. And this forced the displacement of many people and flooded tens of thousands of acres of farmland. On the other hand, when water inputs are less than outputs, lakes can dry up. And on the right, you'll see an image of Lake Mead, a famous reservoir in the southwest United States. And you can see the water level is much lower than the historic norm. So where are all the lakes on Earth? Well, we know there's more than a million lakes on Earth, but they take up less than 2% of land surface area. And in general, northern latitudes dominate that lake distribution. But it's not true for the largest lakes on Earth. Here are the largest lakes on Earth. We have the Laurentian Great Lakes in North America, the Caspian Sea between Europe and Asia, the African Rift Lakes, and Lake Baikal, distributed around the globe. Globally, we see an interesting pattern where small lakes dominate abundance. 
So most lakes on Earth are small. There's over a million lakes that are less than one square kilometer in area. But conversely, large lakes dominate volume. So most of the lake water on Earth is stored in just a handful of large lakes. The Caspian Sea alone is 41% of global lake volume. And those million small lakes, they make up only about 2% of the global lake volume distribution. So now we're gonna talk about lake origin. And a lake's origin is a really good predictor of biological, chemical, and physical characteristics. And we tend to classify lakes based on origin because it's such an important characteristic. One of the original lake classifications was by G. Evelyn Hutchison in 1957, and he classified over 76 types of lakes. We're not gonna cover all 76 types of lakes today, but we are gonna cover a handful of the most common lakes. And these can be classified into four main categories, tectonic lakes, glacial lakes, volcanic lakes, and lakes of other origins. And you can see in table 6.1 that the number of lakes in each of these categories is not uniform. Glacial lakes dominate the number of lakes on Earth. But we're gonna start off talking about tectonic lakes because these are responsible for some of the largest, deepest, and oldest lakes on Earth. And often these lakes have a really unique biological diversity. Tectonic plate movement is responsible for many amazing landscapes on Earth. And this includes lakes. Some of the most famous tectonic lakes are the African Rift Valley lakes, including Lake Tanganyika, which is over 4,800 feet deep. The most common tectonic lakes are graben lakes. And this is a rift or depression created by the movement of plates. You can think about two plates separating. It causes a gap between them, and this results in the formation of a graben. And this is a large depression in the landscape that can often, although not always, fill with water. And some of the deepest and oldest lakes are graben lakes. This includes the African Rift Valley lakes, Victoria, Tanganyika, and Malawi, and also Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal is worth knowing. It's the largest and deepest lake on Earth. It's over 25 million years old and has a maximum depth of 1,600 meters. That's four times deeper than Lake Superior. And it contains 18% of Earth's fresh water. What's also unusual about Baikal is it has over 1,200 animal species, 80% of which are endemic and only live in Lake Baikal. This includes the only known species of freshwater seals. And interestingly, the rift underneath Lake Baikal continues to widen at about one centimeter per year. This XKCD comic sums up the depths of some of the most famous lakes on Earth. You can see the Laurentian Great Lakes on the left, and while deep, they're definitely shallower than some other lakes, including Lake Baikal. Another type of tectonic lake are earthquake lakes. Here's an example of the aptly named Quake Lake in Montana. The lake was formed when a 7.5 magnitude earthquake hit Montana, causing an 800 million ton landslide, which formed a dam on the Madison River. And very soon afterwards, water started ponding behind the dam, forming what we now know as Quake Lake. Next, we're gonna talk about glacial lakes, which are by far the most common type of lake globally. And that's because during the last glacial maximum, ice sheets covered a large part of the Northern Hemisphere, which is most of the landmass on Earth. And glacial lakes are so common that we've subdivided them into many different types based on origin. We have to remember that glaciers are incredibly effective at transforming the landscape. As glaciers advance, they erode and smooth landscapes. And they also leave behind huge amounts of glacial till. You can think of glaciers as bulldozers. And in the shield regions of North America and Europe, which is what we can think of as the boreal forest regions, glaciers fractured the bedrock and created huge numbers of small shallow lakes. And in some regions, glaciers scoured deep basins from pre-existing valleys. So one of the most common types of lakes are ice scour lakes. And these are most of the northern lakes on bedrock. If you zoom into northern Canada on Google Earth, you can see thousands of ice scour lakes across the Canadian Shield. And this is because when ice sheets moved over flat rock surfaces, there was weak areas or fissures in the rocks and this rock splintered and loosened to form these basins, which subsequently filled with water. And glacial lakes are often surrounded by lots of other geological evidence of glacier scour. Another common type of glacial lake are moraine dammed lakes. And a moraine is a glacial feature. It's an accumulation of unconsolidated glacial debris that was typically left behind when glaciers retreated. You can again think of this as the glacial bulldozer, pushing sediments into piles. 
And just like the earthquake lake, that sediment can act as a dam, filling up lakes behind the moraine. A great example of moraine lakes are the Finger Lakes of New York, and these were formed when a moraine dammed several river valleys. And moraines are especially common around the maximum extent of the ice sheet. And so there tends to be a lot of moraine dam lakes in the northern United States. Wisconsin is a textbook example of how glaciers are responsible for the location of many lakes. During the last glacial maximum, the Laurentide ice sheet only covered about half of Wisconsin. In this image, you can see how far the glacier advanced. The southwestern area of Wisconsin, not covered by the ice sheet, we refer to as the Driftless Area. And in the map on the right, this is the location of all the lakes in Wisconsin. And you can see that the Driftless Area is relatively devoid of lakes. Perhaps one time in the past, the Driftless Area had lots of lakes, but over time they would have filled with sediment and rivers would have eroded them into the river channels that we see today. In contrast, the northern area of Wisconsin is a relatively young glacial landscape, and we can see that there are thousands of lakes. Another common type of glacial lake are kettle lakes, and this is when a decaying ice sheet leaves behind ice chunks. When those blocks of ice melt, they leave depressions that fill with water, and the resultant lakes are often small, with very steep sides, and are irregularly shaped in the manner of the original ice chunks that produced them. In many regions, kettle lakes are referred to as pothole lakes. The last type of glacial lakes we're going to talk about are cirque lakes, or tarns. And these typically occur at the head of glacially formed mountain valleys, where glacier scour action formed a circular depression. And over time, these depressions fill with snow meltwater. Occasionally, you'll see a string of cirque lakes that form along mountain valleys. And these are termed paternoster lakes, which is a name derived from Catholic rosary beads. Next up, let's talk about volcanic lakes. Although indirectly controlled by tectonic activity, volcanism can also create lakes. One type of lake is termed a mar lake, and this is when ejected magma leaves behind a fissure that can hold water. We also have crater lakes that form when a volcano caves in, creating a caldera that fills with water. Volcanic lakes are typically deep in relation to surface area and have very small drainage areas due to the steep sides of the volcano. Volcanic lakes are often very clear or deep blue in color because there are very few nutrients and high concentrations of volcanic minerals which limit productivity. To finish up our discussion of lake origins, we're going to talk about a few other ways that lakes are formed, including coastal lakes, solution lakes, riverine lakes, and beaver dams and reservoirs. Coastal barrier lakes, as you can probably guess from their name, are formed near the ocean. And these are typically formed when a basin of water becomes isolated from the ocean, often by wave action or isostatic rebound. These lakes will start as saline water, but over time their water chemistry will change. A solution lake is a lake occupying a basin formed by the dissolution of bedrock. These are often found in areas of limestone rock that is easily dissolved by acidic water. Sometimes the dissolution of bedrock will form cavities that collapse to form sinkhole lakes. These collapses can be quite sudden, and sometimes solution lakes are associated with caves. We're only going to briefly mention riverine or fluvial lakes, of which there are many types, and these are very common at low latitudes that weren't glaciated. One type of riverine lake that you should be familiar with are oxbow lakes, and these are when rivers meander across the landscape and big loops can get cut off and isolated. Here's a cool time-lapse video of an oxbow lake forming in a Peruvian river. You may want to watch it a couple times. No discussion of lake types would be complete without discussing the millions of human-made reservoirs on Earth. Often these reservoirs are made for hydropower and sometimes for drinking water, but they're a major alteration of the hydrological cycle. In 1997, it was calculated that large reservoirs account for a cumulative storage of about 20% of global annual river runoff. However, there are large regional differences. In the United States, the total storage capacity of large dams is more than 75% of the mean annual runoff. In fact, the amount of water that we have stored on the landscape has actually caused a drop in global sea level and has even changed the speed of Earth's orbit, albeit at millions of a second. And when talking about dams, we can't forget about beavers, nature's engineers, who are very capable at forming new lakes. 
And to wrap up, let's look back at Wisconsin. We already learned that Wisconsin has about 15,000 lakes, and this has to do with glacial geology. Here are maps of the Ice Age deposits of Wisconsin. You can see that the glacial areas line up with the location of lakes. So next time you see a Wisconsin lake, or any lake for that matter, think about its origin. How did it get there? And why is it still here?